Can we get a nice, big, warm round of applause for the fellas from the Sonic? A little louder, people. A little louder. We're coming down the stretch. We're coming down the stretch. Right? We're coming down the stretch. Take it away, guys. Oh, hey. Hi, everyone. Uh, so, um, yeah, I'm Liwa Chen. I'm from uh, Insomnia Games. Um, and I'm um, one of the senior character artists who worked on the Spider-Man project. Um, yeah, this guy right here. Um, <laughs> uh, so, um, um, since I'm one of the first person to kind of start on this project, um, um, I've seen the development from the start to the finish. And uh, yeah, it's an interesting process. So I'm going to kind of walk you guys a little bit through uh, the development of uh, Spider-Man just to give, kind of give you guys an idea of how the development kind of came to what, it, what he is right now. Um, so the first problem that we have to face, or the first big question that we have to answer is that, how can we define a Spider-Man that's both iconic and also it's unique enough that we can call our own Spider-Man? Um, especially when you consider there have been a lot of Spider-Man out there <laughs> through the years. And he is one of the most beloved like, heroes, superheroes out there. So it, the pressure is on to, to kind of define a unique look for him, but also he's still stick to uh, what he is as a character. Um, so basically, one of the first thing we... Oh, what, what have, oh. Oops. I think that's missing a, <laughs> missing a slide right there. Um, so one of the first thing we, uh, oh, right here. I don't know why it disappeared. Uh, one of the first thing we had to look at is um, defining the body type. Because uh, he's, uh, the story at, the, at this the, at a very early stage, we already anchored down that this is going to be an older Peter Parker, Peter Parker, and he's just, you know, he's not a teenager anymore. He's more experienced, and, you know, he, He's gonna move differently, and he's gonna, um, you know, approach things differently from you know what he was younger when he was younger. So we consider if he's gonna be more muscular, is he gonna be more athletic? Is he gonna be uh, just more uh, slim in terms of the shape? So we have to kind of play around with uh, different ideas when we're developing him. Um, and the early concept, you can see he's a lot more bulkier. Um, but it, it, it's basically just kind of trying to defining the body type. Um, and the other thing is just figuring out the right elements and their functions on him. Uh, and fairly early, we, we decided to make the materials on him to, to have a purpose. So there's like a layers of more uh, flexible layers. There's also a, a thicker layers and also a protective layers, which is uh, going to be concentrating on protecting his like vital organs and stuff. Uh, so every piece on him needs to kind of serve a purpose. Um, so that's kind of the question that we have to answer uh, fairly early on uh, when it comes to like concepting and designing him. And, um, and I have to keep in mind, uh, because this is the main character in the game, so the narrative, even though it's already anchored down, it's still being developed. Changes and details are still being kind of added into the story. So um, the working on a character like this, you kind of have to keep your process fluid and being able to adapt to changes. Um, so that's kind of a few things that, key things when it comes to him. Um, so this is a early in-game version of what we've done on the concept you just saw. Uh, he's, of course, the body type is different, and he's a lot more slim because, you know, Spider-Man just, um, just, just, just for, him swinging around the city, um, he just needs to be athletic and slim. And, you know, it looks just better this way. But already we're kind of identifying problems like, you know, the color combination uh, seems to be a little bit, it's, it's a little harder to read him uh, in darker areas. And, you know, he's not popping as much as, I, as we wanted. And also the, uh, the leg design doesn't seem to fit a 20-year-old, 23-year-old, uh, you know, athletic Peter Parker would, would wear, you know, it doesn't seem to, to jive well. And the other uh, interesting point is the, um, if you look at the upper leg, this, this one right here, um, it's already demonstrating how it's, 
we need something like blend shapes, extensive use of blend shape on this game because you know, the tube, tubiness uh, of this video gaming looking um, um, look is not acceptable for, for next gen or for, for current gen title. Uh, so this is the early demonstrations of how we identified problems already. Uh, and then we set out to kind of solve them. Uh, this is a closer look of the, uh, the, the, the in-game version, early in-game version. Um, so you can kind of tell that it's, a look, it's quite noisy, especially around this area. Uh, just because the hexagon and also the webbing, the density, they're just kind of fighting a little bit. Uh, so for, this is like all the design question that we have to answer when it, when it comes to designing a character, especially if Spider-Man, he, he, he needs to be just right. Um, so um, the problem is like density, uh, readability, and also uh, fairly early on, animators already starting to pinpoint problems like how we need emotions in uh, the characters, and the eyes are just not emotive enough. So there's another set of problems that we have to address when it comes to designing him. Um, so we, um, we can't just always stretch the frames because it's just, it doesn't really fit into uh, our universe because uh, we just make him look, if you, you, you can do it a little bit, but if it's like constantly doing that just for free motion, it's a little bit too much. So um, that's another question that comes up. Um, so through a, a few passes, you can see now we uh, sort of refine the leg a little bit. Um, it's a little, a little closer to what we wanted, uh, but it's not quite there yet. Um, and uh, the protective materials uh, through the, the narrative development, we decided to kind of give him um, sort of this carbon fiber, futuristic carbon fiber uh, material that's uh, just going to be put on you know, the, the, the vital area, which is the chest and the back, to kind of protect him from attacks. And, uh, um, and later on, after a few more passes, we sort of unified it, and we started to uh, put this protective materials on the gauntlet. So, so it, the, all the protective harder material is one unified white. And uh, you know, the cut lines and uh, on the, uh, the, the red part is the, the, the material that's a little bit more flexible but still thicker. And the blue part is the, 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 the flexible material where, where for articulations and all that, you know, will come, come from. Uh, so we decided to kind of, this is the final design. And the colors, you know, of course, the, the balance and the toning and just kind of bring him uh, to, to the world and for him to be red easily and identify uh, easily during like different uh, environments. So this is a, the, the, the version we have right now. Uh, yeah, it, it took, I think, uh, uh, quite a while, almost like two years, I think, to get this. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so now I'm just gonna dive into the process quickly. Um, since he's, uh, he's, uh, his, his, a lot of the items on him or, or the elements on him is very uh, form-fitting. So um, what we uh, mostly do, this is the, the detail mesh uh, we have for him. So you see a lot of pipings and uh, even the webbing is floating. Uh, the reason for that is because um, we need to make it easy for edits. So we don't cut in anything. Like he's he's basically a canvas, and whatever on him is the layers. So it, we can easily take out anything that's not working. So, like I said, during the process, we have to be uh, agile and adaptable. So, um, uh, and, a, and a quite a straightforward process for for this kind of skin tight suit because we have different suits. Uh, but for a skin tight suit like this, we usually just kind of use poly paint um, to sketch out the webbings, layouts. Because um, the most important things on him, on these kind of characters, are two things. One is the panels, the other one is the webbings. And the webbing sometimes can be tricky because you have to find the right balance and the density, all that. Because, and a, a lot of time, uh, this is kind of interesting question, problem we have to, to answer as well, address as well, is that uh, the density of the body, uh, the webbing is on the body, when it flows into something like a head, you kind of have to gradually reduce it. So you have to know 
where to do it. And there's actually kind of like a right way to do, it, to do this kind of thing. But uh, um, I'm just going to quickly show. Um, so if I have webbings like this, um, usually I have um, my, I created, I created a simple uh, insert mesh brush to just do tracing for something like this. Because um, the reason why I don't use the, uh, what was it called? The, uh, I think it was called. Tube snap. The, the curve snap, uh, strap snap, yeah. It's because using this tool, I have my own polygroup already uh, kind of embedded in, in, the, uh, in the brush. So when I draw the polygon out, I'll say just like that. Like that. Um, I can just basically, oops. Oh, it's not letting me. Okay. Um, I can just basically quickly get the um, topology out, the, the strip out, and start working with it. Splits. So yeah, um, just like that, because they all already have polygroup on it. Um, this way I can select the parts I want and delete the parts that I don't want to, I, I, I don't need. Um, so basically just kind of do this. And because it's being inverted, all this is just to get a simple strips that I can work with because I think uh, working on the piping or the webbings, it's easier when it's just simple strips that I can use the Z modeler tools to do um, modifications. So I don't have to work with like a cube because there's too many points. Um, so when you get to this point, it's just simple snappings and. Uh, um, Stitching and extruding. Um, of course, I can make it prettier, but uh, since this is, this is a demonstration, I'm not going to go too much into making it pretty. Just to uh, get the idea across for you guys. Um, so once it's done, I'll just use QMesh to, to extrude it. Oops. Um, I think I should uh, let's polygroup it again. It's easier this way. So yeah, um, you know, at this stage you can just subdivide it if you want to. But uh, usually I would uh, I'll just make sure the horizontal and the vertical is separate first, hidden separately first, and then. This is all because I just want to get a cleaner subdivision. Um, just basically crease, oh, sorry. I'll do a polygroup um, by normal. And I think 60 degrees kind of works best for this kind of thing. So yeah, once this is like this, let's see. Um, I'll just crease the, uh, crease by polygroup and just divide it. Oh, this, this part is now clean, but, uh, you know, you can always fix that later. Um, but when I subdivide it a little bit into subdivision three, I just usually just take out the, the crease again because I kind of want that softer look on the edges. Um, so if you kind of look at it, there's kind of a quick piping for you um, to start working on for 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 the detail mesh. Um, 
So yeah, that's kind of the, uh, the, the process that we do um, in ZBrush if it comes to getting the information out of Polypaint and kind of just qu quickly use ZModeler or uh, custom brushes to, to build out these, these, all these piping areas. Uh, the other thing we kind of use uh, ZBrush for a lot is uh, for, because uh, on Spider-Man we have different body, so, sort of different body types on Spider-Man, even though we can't really deviate too, too much from the, the, the um, base proportion. But we try to vary, and, vary, vary them a little bit, so they're interesting enough, you know, they're not always the same suit. Um, that's kind of important for us. Um, so uh, if you look at the 2099 suits, um, they're kind of the same built, but they look a little different. And I think the, uh, the, 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 the reason why is because we uh, basically just pick different visual landmarks and we sort of bring them out a little bit. So they look different, but not being really that much different. Like something like the wrist, you know, you can see the, it's a lot, a lot more, has a lot more powerful uh, bent to it, um, and also the you know, look at the thigh area, it has a little bit more defined, uh, defined shape than uh, the Spider-Man, uh, the, the advanced suit. So this is kind of one way to sort of bring variations into what, it, uh, what what's kind of restricted. But uh, there's also one, I think one interesting suit is the, uh, the velocity suit. Um, this is an early visualization that I did for velocity. It's a sketch. But um, it's a sketch of the suit without all the elements on top. And I think for me, it's important to figure out the form before I commit to anything. And I know some people will like to develop a part first and then you know, try to focus on some one area. But I think that's really not a very good way to do things because you, you lose uh, the overall pictures of the, the design. And Velocity is interesting that he has a lot of like shapes built into uh, his body. And I think that it's important to capture the form first, and then you go into the detail uh, later. Um, so ZBrush is really good for, even though it's a mechanical suit, kind of, um, ZBrush is really good for, to, to help me um, quickly figure out, you know, this is like the anchor point that I start from because I actually use this and just basically build off all the other details uh, from this uh, sketch. It's a rather finished sketch, to be honest, but um, this is the final version. Um, yeah, I think you can, whatever you lay on top of it is basically just, you know, basing off um, the basic form so that's already defined there. So. Once you kind of get that form right, it, you know, uh, things can just kind of lay on top and just, you know, they, they just hang on top of it. Um, so that's uh, kind of just uh, a variations on uh, how Spider-Man, you know, the process we have for dif doing different Spider-Man um, suit. Um, this, this, the, 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 the detail mesh for uh, velocity was actually done in Maya, so it's not a ZBrush model, but still ZBrush was a big part of it, um, the development. Um, did I close my PowerPoint? Oh, just have to start from the beginning. <laughs> just sorry. Just um, a quick recap. Just a quick recap. <laughs> uh, yes. So uh, I really went through the, pro uh, the the pipeline, the process. This is basically just outlining what I've done, and this is like the the lineup. Um, uh, just kind of quick overview of uh, how 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 they how they stand on uh, stay by, stand by each other. Uh, well, last thing is well, not the last, but uh, on the Spider-Man is just I think it's one thing interesting to call out is basically um, it's 130k for the in-game mesh, um, and we're cutting a lot of the little detail piping, even though it seems a little excessive. But when you consider there's like the the photo, there's the selfie view. And then, you know, there's a lot of close-up. There's a lot of uh, cinematic of him being in front of the camera. We had to do this. Uh, it, it's not easy, but it takes uh, extra time to do this. But I think the effort of on, on putting, putting it, yeah, all the effort kind of was worth it. Um, 
So our last thing, this is the last thing, um, is uh, the blend shape. I'll just quickly touch, up, touch upon it, just kind of give you guys an idea. Um, so, of course, Spider-Man has a lot of blend shapes, and the ZBrush was kind of was pretty critical when it comes to like doing um, the muscles and you know different flexing and uh, on different poses. Uh, so, for a few key poses, we actually have you know uh, ZBrush uh, detail sculpt and normal map bake, baked out and doing blend uh, normal map blending to to kind of make this illusion work. So, uh, you know how everything is working. Uh, but on the lesser level, which I, when it doesn't require a normal map, we still do a lot of blend shapes um, to just fix like what I was mentioning to you. You know how the leg was being a little bit tubey, like things like that. Um, so he has a lot of extreme poses. So it definitely requires a lot of blend shapes, and uh, this is not all of it. But uh, I think overall we have like 80 blend shapes for Spider-Man. So per suit too. Per suit, every suit needs one, one set of 80, 80 shapes. Yeah, it was quite a feat <laughs> to pull it off. Um, so yeah, uh, that's basically my uh, quick, brief uh, presentation on uh, Spider-Man. <laughs> Any questions? Any questions? We'll take questions for you. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be there in a second. I promise. Hi. Hi. Hey, I have a question. Uh, does all the webbing you make in ZBrush is is it the um, does it get in the final model of the game, the game model, or is it just texture simulated on it? Um, though for the webbings, we don't cut them because they are just gonna require so it's, it's just so much work to. To, to cut the actual webbing. Uh, so webbing is basically on texture. We, we bake the webbing. And they're really fine, too. So if we cut it on the mesh, it's just quite a headache. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yes. where, where do you texture Spider-Man? What? What, 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 did, what did you use to texture? Oh, it's, uh, we use uh, Substance Painter for, uh, for Spider-Man. That was two questions, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Slipped it in there unscathed, unnoticed. Hey, how you doing? Hi. Um, so you're saying about with the, the eye lenses um, weren't expressive enough. So I was wondering, which came first, the, the movie eye lenses, or did you guys sort of come up with the same idea together? Uh, so obviously, like we work. Um, uh, I'm Gavin, by the way. Hello. Uh, we work closely with Marvel uh, from like day one, and together we knew really early on that we wanted to emote. Uh, the movies definitely played a reference, just like all comics. Um, multiple artists have different ways of uh, showing emotion uh, in their renderings. And, um, you know, we, we worked separately. Uh, they just kind of came coincidentally. And, uh, you know, they, they came out first, but I, I would say that it was uh, kind of around the same time. Uh, first off, thanks for the presentation. It's pretty great. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, thank you. It was awesome. Uh, so I saw you guys had the panels as a separate, uh, separate meshes, floating meshes on the body, uh, and I was wondering how you handled that uh, for the blend shape process, and was it like just sculpted on the body, and the panels would follow, or? Yeah. Um, so good question. Yeah, uh, f so basically, uh, if I can go back, I don't know how to operate PowerPoints or, uh, anyways, if uh, basically we have a mesh, or, or a version of Spider-Man without all the pipings cut in, and that's actually the sort of the base mesh, base mesh to do a lot of the, the blending, of the, 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 sh the, 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 the posing, and we use that mesh to do the corrective sculpting and then later on, we transfer the higher version of the piping onto uh, just basically like skin wrap kind of thing and just wrapping it onto the new pose. And sometimes it works, sometimes, you know, there's some areas, small areas you have to fix. Uh, 
So it, depending on how extensive that is, you know, usually it's not too bad, but there are actually a lot of different suits, and they, each of them has different problems that you encounter. Um, so it requires sort of case-by-case -case, uh, sort of uh, solution to fix it. But uh, yeah, but that's kind of the general idea. It's just basing off with a mesh without all the pipings, and then we transfer it later. Yeah. Way in the back. <laughs> Two arms thrust forward at the same time. Yes. Hey, hi. Do you guys use uh, LOD for Spider-Man? Hmm? Sorry, can you speak up? Do you guys use LOD for Spider-Man? LOD? LOD, yeah, we, we have LOD. It has uh, how many LOD? Like five? Yeah. Yeah, five. I think five lots, yeah. So, nice. Yeah, the top lot would, was with, is the one with the piping. And then the, the one without the piping will be second, and then gradually, yeah. You got a big thumbs up here, emphatic <laughs> thumbs up. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, so there's two costume details that you guys came up with with your Spider-Man design that I particularly enjoy. And I wonder if you could discuss the decision to give him a shoe-like tread on the bottom of his foot and those kind of knuckle guards and uh, padding on the back of his hand. It's kind of a cool uh, detail. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, sure. Um, so we were creating our own suit. Uh, like Leroy's mentioning, it was really important that we show the guy under the suit, right, and try to tell the story about this older Peter Parker and maybe things that he's learned along the way. So through that, we start looking at athletic gear, parkour uh, gear, and stuff like that to better show that he's learned, hey, maybe when I'm swinging through the city and I slam into a building, uh, you know, I need some protective, you know, padding on my hips. Or, um, you know, for his shoes, like looking at, you know, athletic shoes for, you know, keeping, keeping grip when he's like running around and stuff like that. So really a lot of it is just trying to show that older, uh, more wise uh, Peter Parker and reflecting that through, you know, references in the real world and trying to uh, show his, you know, improved function in our world. I personally like that he, he looks uh, like he's on a massive quantity of HGH. It's like 40-year-old Peter Parker on a dose. <laughs> I like it a lot. <laughs> what else? Hey, yeah, nice hat. Um, this question is mostly for a concept art point of view. Um, before Spider-Man, you know, his logos have been black. But what, why you had the decision to make that logo you know, white, like what's, like, what's the, the art direction behind it? Like, mm -hmm. Why make him stand out from the rest version of Spider-Man? Right. So, uh, Good question, man. Yeah, great Brian question. Guru back here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there's a, f a few reasons why we would do it. Uh, if you've played the game, uh, you know, there's a, a narrative reason behind it. Um, holistically, it's also something that makes us stand out. Uh, we wanted to back that up in a story and have reason. You can't just say, like, that's ah, white because mm, it looks cool. You know what I mean? So we, we had to have a reason that would ground it in our world and make it make sense for, you know, its existence kind of thing. Understanding that it's a departure from many, many, many suits and it is, like, the main thing that stands out that's different. And um, that, that's, like, the core reason for it. But then also, during gameplay, it stands out because it's this perfect white logo right there, right? And when you're fighting, you know, dozens of guys in the, uh, in the game, it helps pop them out from all of our enemies as well. Yeah, that's a good point. There's nothing like fighting 12 people at one time. <laughs> <laughs> Ask me off camera. Next up. Hey guys, um, a suit that I really liked was the, uh, the shadow suit, I think it's, or the opposite negative man, whatever, I forget what it's called, sorry. Um, but how different was it making that suit as opposed to the others? Because it's like there's so much glowing on it and everything. Did you guys use more like texturing and did you guys model it differently? Or? Yeah, so there's a, a few different custom suits that we have. There's like negative, uh, vintage. I want to say there's another special one that's slipping my mind right now. Um, it's working one at the end. Right. And but the anyway, yeah, yeah. So the, these two are very custom and we have insanely talented tech art team. Uh, that's Jay Tawasson and Chris Perella. Round of and applause, round of yeah. applause. Please. <laughs> Make some noise for those guys. Absolutely. Yeah. They, are, uh, <laughs> they are 
infinitely smarter than I am, <laughs> slightly smarter than the rest of these guys. And uh, <laughs> they can, basically we're creating like custom shaders, custom technology for them that's a custom lighting model. So with like vintage, it stands out. With negative, it stands out. So while it's based on our unique suit, there's a lot of technical work that I can't really explain because I'm a caveman. And, um, you know, we basically made that, uh, you know, as it's like a, a nod to the actual negative version in the, in the comics, but we wanted to show, like, the negative powers, uh, you know, the things that we're already um, explaining with inner demons and the negative verse and stuff like that. So uh, the, the short answer is it's a lot of custom math-heavy work that uh, Jay has put together for us. Really cool. Put the hands together again, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> why not? Yeah, yeah so it would be uh, Dustin. Dustin's going to take yep. us into the yeah. uh, deeper realms of uh, cloth spiderdom <laughs> and the cloth that is uh, the spider costume, right? Uh, clothing. Yeah, clothing, mm -hmm. just in general, but not. In general. OK. <laughs> Sit tight. It's really great. Hey, what's it like for you to work on this property? This is my question. Any one of you can take this. What's it like to work on a property like this for you? It's uh, very fun, actually, because yeah. we all like Spider-Man, and we, we, we get exposure from, from different sources and different time you know, in our life. But uh, you know, it's, it's basically a dream come true to work on a property like this. It's fantastic to hear. It's a great yeah. responsibility. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no pressure. Yeah. <laughs> Take it away, Dustin. <laughs> <laughs> I think Dustin's just getting set up here. For yeah, me. I'm just getting set up. Give me just a sec. Air guitar. Where's our Where's our install at? Okay, uh, hi guys, I'm uh, Dustin Brown. <laughs> I'm a character artist at uh, Insomniac Games, and I'm gonna be talking to you guys about the cloth pipeline we use uh, for Marvel Spider-Man, and how ZBrush is integral to that process. Specifically, I'm gonna be using Aunt May as an example. She's a great case study of a character that was really important to the story of our game, and uh, used uh, the, the complete uh, cl uh, cloth pi pipeline for, um, for, the, for the game uh, uh, from back to end. Um, just to quickly go over the, the basics of what we're going to be talking about, I'm going to go over um, my reference analysis process and what I look for in my references. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, fold fundamentals and how to identify different types of folds. Uh, base production mesh and how we source that. And then I'm gonna hop over into ZBrush, do a little bit of demonstration work for you guys. And then I'll switch back over and talk about production geometry, which gets a little bit more to the real-time side of things. Uh, corrective blend shapes for cloth and how we use those on the rig. And then hopefully there'll be a little bit of time for Q&A at the end. So that's a lot to cover, so let's jump in. Um, every article of cloth uh, represents its own unique challenges uh, so in order to cover as much territory for you guys as I can in the short amount of time, I'm going to focus exclusively on uh, May's button-up shirt. And in terms of art direction, we knew that we wanted her button-up shirt to be uh, casual and be made of uh, breathable cotton. We know we wanted it to uh, fit her well, and she needed to have rolled up sleeves to fit with her character in the game. And the shirt needed to not only work on its own, uh, but also with two different types of sweaters. And here you can see examples of that shirt and how it was used in game, both on its own on the right and also with the two different types of sweaters on the left. And so when I'm looking for references, I really try to pare it down as much as possible. I'll usually have uh, maybe one primary reference source and a couple of secondary reference sources at most. 
I usually find that uh, if I have too many references that I'm looking at, it can really start to muddy the results of what I'm trying to accomplish. For example, if I have 10 different shirts that I'm looking at in my reference board and each of them has folds in different configurations, I can end up wasting a lot of time trying to reconcile the folds on each of those shirts uh, as opposed to having a more narrow uh, set of references that I can target more directly and accurately. I try to find references that are as high resolution as possible uh, so that I can see uh, as much detail in those references as I can. Uh, if I can find the same article of clothing in uh, multiple angles, like a turntable, that's really ideal. And if I can find detail shots of things like seams and stitching and lapels, things like that, that's fantastic. I'll make sure I get that as well. Um, find that shirts that are somewhere in the mid-value range tend to work best. Uh, it helps to identify secondary information like folds much more easily. I usually try to avoid uh, references that have a lot of noisy patterns in them. I find that it makes it more difficult to read the forms. You can see that even just something as basic as pen stripes are making it much more hard to read the folds as opposed to something that's uh, a flat mid-value gray on the right. And so whether we're talking about anatomy or material definition or types of folds or even something as small as stitching, I'm a big proponent of taking the time to learn the names of these things as we encounter them over the course of our career. Uh, even something as small as a zigzag stitch, if you know that there are subcategories of zigzag stitch and you're observing that in your references, you can then do much more targeted searches and you can communicate much more effectively with your peers. And once you've found those uh, more specific uh, references, you can go on to, the, to do some really interesting things, like you can model different weaves and stitches out. You can bake those down for uh, tiling textures that you, that you can then feed into your real-time shader. More and more AAA games these days are, are starting to ship with photo modes, which really enables uh, consumers to get super close to your character models. And so this level of detail just helps your work hold up to even more scrutiny, which become really important. So tools like Marvelous Designer and Photogrammetry are wonderful tools as a starting point, but at some point in your career as a character artist, you're going to have to sculpt cloth. There's just no getting around it. And so to that end, knowing and being able to identify the different types of folds that we observe in nature really becomes critical to that process. And so I'm just gonna go over quickly some of the more uh, common ones that we, that we see on actual cloth. Starting from the left, we have pipe folds. And these occur with an array of um, anchor points that allow the cloth to drop down freely in a vertical way that creates almost like an organ pipe-like pattern of parallel pipes. Next over, we have drop folds that originate from a single anchor point and array out dropping freely down. Usually you'll see these on knees, elbows, shoulders, areas like that. Next we have diaper folds that originate from two anchor points, allowing the cloth to sag in the middle. Then we have zigzag, spiral, and half lock folds. On a zigzag, uh, usually this occurs on cylindrical cloth, in this case a sleeve, where you have a bend. And in the crook of that bend, you, you'll see lightning bolt or zigzag-like patterns occurring. Similarly, on a spiral fold, you also see that on cylindrical cloth, in this case, the leg of a pair of pants. Uh, only in this case, you'll see it uh, uh, being caused by either compression and or uh, twisting. Here we have a uh, boot pushing the leg up, and the foot is also turned out, causing both compression and twisting. Half log folds are kind of interesting. I, I tend to think of them as a bit of a mix between uh, diaper and, sp and uh, spiral folds. Uh, and that you, again, have the two anchor points, but in this case, one is dominant over the other, uh, causing uh, breaks or half locks uh, wherever there's a change in direction in the fold. And so knowing this sort of thing becomes really important when you actually get to your ZBrush work because you can replicate what you see in nature. So in terms of uh, sourcing our base production mesh, you usually have one or two methods of, of doing that. It's either gonna be photogrammetry or using cloth simulation like Marvelous Designer. In the case of Spider-Man, we used an exclusive uh, Marvelous Designer uh, pipeline. Uh, but regardless of what you use, usually you're gonna end up with a triangulated mesh that's not really great to work with in ZBrush. And so what I like to do to that end is I'll, I'll bring both my flat and my 
my 3D simulated mesh from Marvelous Designer into Maya, I'll retopologize that down to quads that I know are going to subdivide and I'm going to be able to work with well in ZBrush. And then I use the transfer attributes tool in Maya to essentially retarget that onto the simulated cloth using the, uh, the UVs as a sample space. I'll then subdivide that a couple of times and use the transfer attributes tool again just to make sure I'm capturing all the full data that I got from Marvelous. And then from there, I can bring that into ZBrush. And this is the same exact shirt that I had in the presentation. And you can see here that if I go into frame mode, it's still pretty high. Um, and because it's all quads, what I can do is I can go down to geometry, I can hit sub, uh, reconstruct subdiv a couple times, and I have a really nice base mesh that I can use to grab, say, like my move tool, and I can make really broad sweeping adjustments to my primary shapes uh, very quickly. And what I can do is I can use control shift W, that's gonna give me a quick set of polygroups based on the panels that I have for Marvelous. And if I step back up, what I usually like to do is I'll go to my smooth brush, turn my intensity down to something around 10, and then I'll use the alt smooth uh, tool, which is basically uh, you hold down shift, start to smooth, and then if you release shift, what that's going to do is it's going to start to smooth out a lot of that surface noise that you got from Marvelous while maintaining the forms of the folds themselves that you got from Marvelous. And then I might go in with a smooth topological breath, uh, brush and I'll start to just make some broad uh, sweeping adjustments, maybe bringing in some of these seams a little bit tighter, uh, cleaning up the lapels a little bit, just kind of um, scooting things around in a very general way. Maybe I'll step down and kind of work out uh, some of the kinks on the bottom of this shirt here. Things like that. And so if I step down to my next uh, sub tool, you can see an example where I've done just that. I've gone through and I've smoothed out a lot of that noise. You can see on the bottom of the shirt, if I just toggle back and forth, you can see where I've cleaned out the bottom of the shirt, brought a lot of the seams together. So at this point, I'm really just looking to evaluate what I've gotten from Marvelous and look for any areas that I find uh, visually distracting. And just right off the bat, what I'm noticing is uh, some repeating fold patterns coming off the side here, coming off of her bust. In general, in general I feel like there's uh, too much emphasis on her bust, which is um, going to be out of character for Aunt May. And there's a little bit too much uh, of, an, of an hourglass shape to her hips, again, which is out of character for Aunt May. I also feel that the sleeves are a little bit too tight, and I want to get those a little bit more loose. And, uh, and so what I've done here is I've basically gone in and I've diffused a lot of those folds that were distracting before. I've de-emphasized her bust, uh, toned down that hourglass shape, and I've redirected a lot of these folds coming off of her shoulder. If I turn on polygroups, you can kind of see what I usually see in my mind's eye where I'm visually identifying in red where my anchor points are. And you can, just going back to the fold types that we've uh, talked about earlier, you can see where we've got some drop folds coming off of her bust, off of her shoulders onto both the front and the backs of her sleeves. I've got some half lock folds on her armpits uh, where her sleeve is being pushed up. I've got the beginnings of some spiral folds. And then in the crook of her elbow, we've got some zigzag folds where they would naturally occur. And so here I've just continued refining that process, starting to get into um, just defining the, the corners of these folds a little bit more and some of the transition points. For example, here we have uh, some drop folds that are transitioning into some spiral folds. And I want to make sure I've got some nice uh, aesthetically pleasing um, transition points for that. I might even at this point start to add in some buttons just so I can visually see where those are going to be and I may want to have some tension folds that come off of, come off of those. And you can see that uh, at this point I'm still only at subdivision four because I really don't need a lot of subdivisions to uh, dial in a lot of the secondary information. I really only want to subdivide once I'm starting to do things like sculpt in some stitching uh, or seams. And I can start to like um, book in some of these seams just with a basic uh, standard brush. I don't know why that's not sculpting. Huh. 
weird. Anyway, uh, I don't know why that's not working. Anyway, uh, uh, for the sake of moving along, uh, I'll just show you guys uh, the finished Aunt May shirt here. It's really just a lot more of the same. It's just going through and referencing uh, uh, your, re your visual references and refining the cloth and just taking the time to, to go in and sculpt those folds uh, and seams. Um, I know that there are a lot of uh, like, like alphas that you can use to, to put it like a, on a rolling brush for this type of waffling pattern. I don't tend to use those. I find that it produces a lot of repeating uh, patterns that are pretty obvious, and so it doesn't really take that much time to do it by hand. And I'll, just, I'll go in and do things like in the Pels. I'll go ahead and break that up and add some, add some character to it, just so it looks broken in and worn. Little things like turning out the, the corners of the pockets can help add a lot of character to it as well. Just a little attention to detail like that. And then if I load up, her finished model, I'll show you guys everything all put together. So here's her full outfit uh, with the jeans. She has an undershirt, some cuffs, her shoes. Um, the jeans went through a few different iterations. But you can see this is very loosely based on what I got out of Marvelous Designer, but there's been a lot of uh, artistic changes that um, were part of an internal conversation and just kind of referencing uh, the concept art as well. And so if you step down to your lowest subdivision level in ZBrush, uh, that's really gonna give you a solid starting point for your real-time mesh. And all you really need to do at that point is insert some extra edge loops in areas that you know are gonna need to go through the most amount of deformation, like the shoulders and elbows, and then maybe uh, making a few extra cuts uh, to hold the shape of the folds that you've established in your high poly model. That way you're getting the same interesting uh, silhouette beats uh, from your, from your in-game model that you have on your sculpt. And once we have all the clothing finished off, we'll pass it to a rigging team, and they'll test it on the rig, uh, taking it through a variety of poses, uh, looking for things like loss of volume, uh, clipping, things of that nature. And uh, then we'll usually go through uh, a corrective blend shape creation process, and a lot of these uh, blend shapes were created by our associate character artist who's sitting in the front there, Marco Villapagno. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And um, so for those that don't know, a blend shape is essentially a, a, a linear interpolation animation between two meshes that have the same geometry but are different shapes. And for example, if you have a cube and you subdivide the cube a couple times but you leave the edges and corners nice and sharp and cuby, and then you copy that cube and you smooth it down into a sphere, the point order is the same, the triangle count is exactly the same, but just different shapes, and so you can create a blend shape relationship between those two meshes so that you can morph back and forth between the cube and the sphere. And so the principle is the same here. We're just using, we're just doing it on more complex shapes than primitives. And here we have, uh, we have a video example of a blend shape being used on Mary Jane's jacket in a shoulder with an arm raise. And we can see that um, once the blend shape gets turned off there, we're getting loss of volume, and the shape's just not holding up. And we're also getting stretching on the stitch patterns. And so turning that blend shape back on brings a lot of that volume back, gives it the shape that we would expect to see. And that's all for me. Thank you for your time. Questions? Hey. Hey, uh, 
uh, I have a question about the, the micro wrinkles that you, uh, you that I seen on the AMA uh, shirt. How did you go about um, applying that? Did you use a noise maker, or did you pretty much just uh, apply those those micro wrinkles um, uh, using just alphas? Yeah, a lot, a lot of the memory folds, uh, we have a couple of ways we can accomplish that. We can actually do it as, as an overlay within the real-time material. But for what you saw in ZBrush there, um, I usually do it on a layer so that I can turn that off if I need to. And um, you can find alphas of something like uh, crumpled up paper. Uh, and you can just put that in like a drag rectangle brush at a really low intensity setting and just kind of pepper that along the surface of your of your uh, of cloth. You want to keep things in mind like where uh, it's going to naturally crease and bend. Uh, in the case of that cl uh, particular piece of cloth, I didn't want it to look starchy and iron, so I was just kind of peppering it all over uh, the article of clothing. Hey, I'm on my way. Hello. Um, thank you for uh, sharing with us. I, I know I really appreciate it. Um, but I was wondering, you know, when it comes to, you know, when you transferring from Marvelous to ZBrush, is there like a reason or is it better to go through Maya than to use the quad, convert to quads while you're already in Marvelous? I mean, is there a benefit yeah. to doing so? Yeah, so when you're exporting a mesh out of Marvelous, you have a couple of options. You can um, you can have a triangulated mesh, or you're right, it does have a quad option. But the issue with the quad option out of Marvelous is that it's not in a clean grid-like pattern. It's, it's following the forms of the folds that it has simulated. And because of that, you're going to have a lot of uh, five-star pulls in some really unfortunate places that you're going to be fighting the entire time you're trying to sculpt on it in ZBrush. That's why I take the time to retopologize it. It's also really nice to get that low res that you can start for your, your in-game character. Yeah. That's right, because you get, you get a free set of UVs at the end of that, which is real nice. Free is good. Free is good. <laughs> <laughs> um, this might be a question for a couple of you in tandem, but could you speak about the physicality of Peter Parker versus Spider-Man and how that relates to the costume on top of his, his body? like that kind of contained strength that he has when he's trying to just be a normal guy walking around in a lab coat? Sounds like a Gavin question. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Uh, so just so I uh, understand the question, are you talking about like a difference between the two or? Uh, maybe when, he, uh, when he puts on the costume, maybe when he embodies Spider-Man as a character, he might, when he goes HGH, as Lily says, um, <laughs> Does he, does he carry himself differently, and does that relate to how you think about folds and, and maybe clean lines versus a crumpled shirt that he has in a backpack when he needs to rush off to work? Yeah, um, generally, yeah. So um, obviously they, they share the same uh, body type, right? So we uh, base all of our clothing off of, of Spider-Man. Uh, we do shrink a few things in just so he's not like super uh, ripped running around, but it is the same body type in the end. Um, that does help inform uh, any of our like landmarks for folds and stuff, like Dustin's saying. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, it, it does. Yeah, so we can we kind of like look at uh, like any of the anatomy from there. There are things that we do consider from like a story point of view, like you know Pete. Uh, I, I wouldn't say is the most fashionable guy, uh, or isn't as concerned about fashion, and uh, as you know, would store things in backpack stuck to a wall or, you know, it is, would be the kind of person that would, you know, just take a shirt off and ball it in the, the corner, right? Uh, from our, like, opening cinematic, you also see, like, his suit is balled up and, you know, he's kind of, like, pulling that out and it doesn't smell so good. So, um, uh, things like that we also consider for, like, fold work, quality of fabric, things like that. So, he's not going to be, uh, I wouldn't know what a, a good shirt is, but uh, he's not, like, walking around in, like, a silk shirt or anything like that. It would be, like, a, a more crumpled thicker like flannel that he would have um, like available to him. <laughs> yes, yeah, making my way over there. Yeah, the beard is strong, fellow. Yeah, uh, how much time are you guys spending 
in Marvelous versus ZBrush? Like, what's the runtime for the sculpting, like, re-sculpting over folds and stuff? I think that's really dependent upon the individual artist and um, their personal preference. Uh, I know I, I personally, uh, I'll spend a certain amount of time in Marvelous where, you know, I'm placing pens and I'm playing with uh, fabric and simulation properties and I, I just kind of feel like I'm hitting a point of diminishing returns and I, I just feel like I can get my results a lot more quickly uh, by sending it over in a ZBrush and where I have like a move brush and a standard brush and I can just start kind of hammering away at it. Um, but we have other artists on the team that uh, are able to get uh, something approaching uh, finished results just in Marvel's designer. Uh, so there's really no hard and fast rule to it. It just comes down to personal preference. Anybody else? We swing forward. <laughs> Okay, round of applause again. Thanks. Doing great, guys. Who we got up next? Uh, Jason. Jason, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together. Here we go. Everybody, I'm Jason Fitch, character I said in Sound Me at Games. <laughs> Thanks. Appreciate it. So today I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, my ZBrush hard surface pipeline, um, specifically on Rhino. Um, and I spent a lot of time early on in Rhino's development sort of bashing my head against Maya and trying to get nice edge flow out of hard surface. and um, it just really wasn't working for me, and I needed something that was much more uh, artist-friendly um, and something sort of formulaic that I could continue to repeat um, so I wasn't getting stranded just trying to figure out um, different edge flow. Um, and essentially, using a lot of methods from other artists, uh, Furio Tedeschi, Michael Pavlovich, um, Andre Christier, I was able to sort of cobble together something that really worked well for me um, and I was able to use on Rhino. So this starts off with a DynaMesh block out, which is very rough. Um, then we go through a formulaic process, essentially, to get nice, clean, hard surface. Um, and then from there, do a lot of the high-frequency texturing uh, for the game in Substance Painter. So this DynaMesh block out uh, is essentially proportions and placement for rigging, animation, and design. We can start to go in and figure out where joints are going to be placed, how different elements are deforming. Um, this is really critical um, while the, the narrative is being adjusted. So uh, funnily enough, Rhino actually started uh, looking more like a gorilla, and he would actually run uh, on his fists. Um, and as the, the design of the boss battle was adjusted, and we sort of wanted him to be more of that man in a suit, um, we had to bring his proportions to be more naturalistic. Um, and getting this off to uh, design and rigging and animation as quickly as possible so that we could see how it was working in game was very important. So having this quick DynaMesh sculpt that we could decimate uh, was really great. So we can design in 3D where the concept is vague. Uh, Daryl Mandrick did an awesome job with this concept, um, but I don't expect him to go in and just paint every little detail for me. Um, that's really where the fun comes in for me is I get to go in design all these elements, and I can quickly do that in DynaMesh without worrying about edge flow or topology or anything like that. Uh, and again, just quickly making changes, addressing feedback, very critical to get feedback from the other character artists on your team, people who are playing the game, um, and adjust how this is going to look. You can actually see, um, I'll show you the final mesh in a minute, but his neck is really kind of squashed in there, and after getting this to rigging and seeing it in game, we could tell that he just couldn't move his head, which is <laughs> kind of a problem considering he likes to hit people with his horn. So he needed to be able to go down and, and whack people. Um, and that just wasn't working. Um, 
So then after making adjustments, we can clean up the DynaMesh to get the final meshes. So like I said, I was trying traditional poly modeling. I was extruding stuff on the surface. I was laying down my edge loops, trying to figure out how things were going to look. Um, and the big problem here was that I didn't have uh, a final picture of what this was going to look like, right? I could sort of see this end result in my head, right? But I started with this primitive. Um, and instead of doing that, I wanted something that I could repeat consistently, not worry about where these edges are being laid down. Um, and it's also confusing. Like, you, you start off with something like this, um, Rhino's head here, his helmet. Uh, what primitive really is going to be the best for that? Uh, I had no idea. Um, I knew that <laughs> I, I wanted to get this looking perfect from the get-go, so I needed to jump into DynaMesh and just start moving stuff around so I could achieve this. Um, so essentially, I came up with this sort of relief hard surface. So we have the DynaMesh. We know exactly what, what we want it to look like. And then we use uh, ZeroMesher to really quickly get topology. Right? Just lay this down all over the surface, trust in ZBrush's algorithm a little bit to, to give us quick topology. Um, and then start deleting a lot of edges. Um, this is where the relief sort of mode comes in. Um, the more edges I delete, the more the uh, subdivision algorithm is going to take over when they finally smooth this thing. So again, that process. I'm going to dive into ZBrush in a minute here and get a little bit more detailed. Um, but you can see Rhino has a lot of subtools, a lot of subtools. <laughs> <laughs> so I needed to be able to repeat this process and all of these subtools very quickly. So essentially, this is masking, splitting off any components that will actually be separate meshes, using Polish by Features to polish up the rough DynaMesh sculpt, uh, really smooth things out, using ZeroMesher to get that quick topology, and ZModeler to then start removing it again, that relief mode, panel loops to get uh, thickness where we need it, and then dynamic subdivision and creasing um, to get a preview of our subdivision algorithm without actually uh, applying it, which is going to allow us to use a lot of the features in ZBrush that require you to not have any subdivisions. So if you're using deformers, um, if you want to just go in and use ZModeler, you can do that without having to freeze anything. So you can somewhat script this through macros, right? So you can take a lot of that and condense it into a couple of button presses. And if you've got a nice UI, uh, layout. ZBrush does a great job of letting us make our own UI. Um, you can have all that stuff nearby. You can get variable edge smoothing through crease level. So if for some reason you needed this boot to be uh, a lot denser or the material suddenly changed to be rubber, um, we may not want it to be held up as well, right? So we can adjust the crease level and smooth this a little bit more. Again, we don't have to freeze subdivision levels. And you can see your end result from the beginning of the process. A couple of drawbacks. Um, dynamic subdivision is a little bit processor intensive. So if you've got 73 subtools, eh, slow down the viewport a little bit. Um, it's a little bit more step heavy than traditional stuff, but it kept me from getting lost in the weeds of just editing vert by vert. Um, the crease method uh, of subdivision can actually create poles in your model. And you can actually sort of see this here where the boot cuts in. I don't know if you guys can see my mouse. Um, but there's a couple of ways around that. You can design around it. So instead of having this cut in, you could just have this part sit on top. Um, you could manually lay in edges with ZModeler. Or uh, as recommended by Leroy Chen, you could actually go in and make this sort of part of your design. So you could take this whole edge loop and crease it. And then you're getting a, kind of an interesting planar uh, effect after doing that. And because Rhino is so aggressive, adding more planes in and, and sort of angling them uh, downward gives us sort of a nice, more aggressive feel to the character. Uh, and no end guns. I'm a big fan of end guns and uh, high poly stuff. Um, and you just can't do that in ZBrush right now. So you can see up here that this was an end gun that I sort of just stuck a triangle in. <laughs> oh well. And through this process, we get nice, clean uh, meshes. This is the final mesh. Um, you can actually see up here there was an area where we had one of those poles and I actually put in a plane here. It just gives it a little bit more of a nicer, aggressive look. Um, some references. Michael Pavlovich, Mike Jensen, Andrew Christier. Um, the id Software character team inspired me to actually get better at Z modelers. Thank you. 
all of these guys, <laughs> and everyone in Insomniac could help make Rhino happen, uh, all awesome people. So let's jump into ZBrush, y'all. Ah, hmm. interesting. Oh, I've never seen that before. That's not good. All right. Let's see. All right. So here we have our. Ooh, look at that red wax. <laughs> Can I change that. It's the best. Yeah. So here we have our uh, final Dynamesh sculpt, right? Um, He's sitting around four million triangles, which is pretty low for what I would expect for this guy. He's uh, roughly twice, this, twice the height of Spider-Man, as you can see. Um, through most of the game, he's actually bent over, so he doesn't actually look quite as large. Um, but we can go in and pick a piece here and convert this. Um, and first, I'm going to duplicate the subtool so that I don't lose all this nice information. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and mask off this piece here. Just real quick. Doesn't have to be perfect just yet. Control W to polygroup that. Um, and then I'm going to solo it, control shift. Um, we can turn on solo here, we can see it by itself. Sorry guys, I need to uh, just fix this real quick. Eh, I don't know where it is. Don't worry about it. So we're going to use the deformation tab, uh, polished by features, which is really going to start to clean up these jagged edges here. Let me just run that a few times, clean this up. Um, Move this around, straighten it out a little bit. Um, we can even run polish by features with this uh, sort of checkbox here unchecked. Um, and that's going to smooth more of the inside and not just the border. I'm going to use H polish to actually make this a little bit more planar. Because um, it is a rather planar feature. We don't necessarily need that curvature in. And we can bring it back um, using deformers, which is really nice. I'm just going to run this a few more times. Cool. And then we're going to use zero measure and start getting that topology we want. So I'm going to run this around 1,000 polygons, keep it kind of low, see what we get. All right. Not sure what. Oh, sorry, folks. I forgot to delete hidden. We're going to go to modify topology, delete hidden, just get rid of that stuff. We don't need it. And we'll zero mesh this. Great. All right. Not the best, but we're going to sort of full ZBrush and the Z mo uh, Z remesher algorithm into doing what we want. So we're going to pull out these corners to make sure we get nice, crisp edges for this. Um, and then I'm going to go through this process again. Right? And I can turn on dynamic subdivision now, start to see what we're going to get. There's a lot of wobbles in here. It's just too dense right now. I'm going to bring it down again and Z remesh it again. This is a little bit closer to what we want. Um, still too high poly, right? Turn this on, still wobbly. Um, this isn't maintaining its shape. So what I'm going to do now, I'm actually going to run this one more time. Sweet, all right. So now, Z modeler, we can go in and start deleting these edges. Just a space bar here, go in and hit delete over the edge, edge loop complete. Just going to start going through and getting rid of them. Not really caring about the edge flow, what I'm doing in this moment. Just trying to get this a lot lower. Ooh, uh, that's not going to be great. Yeah, so this triangle down here is sort of uh, causing problems. So we can go ahead and fix that. We can use uh, split here on this edge. I'll just add in some more topology and then bridge two points to get, just complete that loop so that it's not as bad and we can take, get rid of these extra edges. Don't need them. 
possible. All right. So we can use slide to sort of reorder things. It's going to be nice because it's just going to move along those existing edges. All right. So we're getting something kind of close to what we want. Uh, and again, what we want is this piece here, right? So let's go ahead and add some thickness. So we can use panel loops under our edge loop settings here. Um, and if we just do it now, we can see that it's just going to polish the hell out of it. It's not what we want at all. So we can reduce this polish. Um, it's a little bit better if you have this ticked. Uh, you have this on. It's going to maintain it a little bit better. Um, it, so if you did have a little bit more geometry, it would maintain that. Um, but I'm just going to turn it off entirely. Um, and I'm going to set my elevation negative because I was working on the surface of Rhino's uh, mesh here. And I want to actually push down in rather than coming out. Because I don't want to alter the volume of the character necessarily. Um, we can also edit the bevel profile here. Um, if you guys want to get rid of these, you can just fling them off. <laughs> get out of here. Awesome. So if we turn on a dynamic subdivision again, we can see we're just losing those hard edges. Um, so like you've probably seen on this stage a few times, we're going to go down to polygroups, which is not that, polygroups, and group by normals, which is actually going to look at the surface angle here and give us a new polygroup um, every time it's greater than currently 45 degrees. Um, and if I now go into my geometry tab, I go to creasing, I can crease by polygroups. And now when we do our dynamic subdivisions, it's maintaining those edges, right? So that's still a lot harder than we want. Um, so we can drop this crease level from 15 to 2. So it's only going to maintain those creases for two levels. Um, and right now our dynamic subdivision is at 2. So if we bump that up to 3, we get to see some nice softening of these edges. We go to 4, we get rid of some of the faceting. Awesome. And then we can go in with Z modeler again, and we can start creasing some of these edges uh, that we didn't crease before, or even moving creases uh, where we want to. Because in the final mesh, this is actually a little bit softer, right? So we can go in and remove individual creasing, pull that out. Um, just getting a little bit softer. And then from there, we can go in and detail this a little bit better. We can use the Z modeler to bevel. We just grab this whole edge and bevel it. We can use our polygroup by normal again. So you can see I'm using these uh, quite a bit, right? So these are features that we'll want to house into our own custom UI. Um, there's a lot of good tutorials out there for that um, that I recommend you guys look into. So yeah, essentially through this process, I was able to get the final mesh uh, for Rhino. Um, and for me, this was a lot faster um, than trying to use just Maya to achieve this. Um, and then we can go ahead and we can apply our dynamic subdivision. So now we actually have these as real subdivisions. And we can subdivide further. Um, whoop, whoop, that's a little bit high. <laughs> Um, and if we wanted to, we could start carving in some panel lines here, um, which we could then go on to essentially repeat the process, right? Break this off, add some thickness, uh, separate this, have our creasing, so we can have this as a separate mesh as well for these details. Um, yeah, so any questions on that? That's, that's my demo. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, a brave one. You also have a strong beard. Hi. So, basically, the question is why do you choose to use zero measure over and over versus just drawing the topology right on top? Um, it's a lot faster for me. Um, I don't have, I guess in my mind, I can't see exactly where I want that topology to necessarily be from the get-go. Um, so just using zero measure to get it really fast uh, works nicely for me. And I can just start pulling those out and 
just my preference, really. Way in the back. Hang on one second. Making me work for it. Appreciate it. Hey, so I'm wondering how much you end up using the topology that you make in ZBrush in game versus retopologizing certain pieces. It looks like that face you probably have to go in and draw some new topology over, but some of those hard surface pieces look really clean. Could you just drop those right into Unreal or something? Uh, so some of them I, I did use uh, the lowest subdivision level or the second subdivision level. Um, which actually worked really nicely. But Rhino is actually a continuous mesh for the most part. There are a few areas that are separate. Um, but just to get a cleaner bake, rather than have everything as a separate piece, um, you can see these pauldrons here are a separate piece. But like all of this stuff is all connected. Um, and I can set up my edge flow in such a way on the low poly that when I bake, um, I, can, I can bake down a lot of these curved surfaces nicely into the normal map. Um, if they're actually combined. Uh, if, they're, if they were separate, if they're not high enough resolution, you can start to see where the different intersections are, like up here and here. Um, so just having him as more of a continuous mesh uh, worked really nicely. And it was a lot easier for rigging that way, too. Anybody else? Was that an arm? No. OK, I guess we clap. <laughs> That's it. That's, is that it? Yeah, oh, yeah. we better make even more noise. That's it. <laughs> yes, please. Okay.